midst of Chesterfield. Um, I'm a Christian, conservative, Republican, and in that order, unapologetically. I love how Mike Pence stated that, and I think we can turn down the uh, music there, here. Um, I serve on four committees, health and education, transportation, local governments, and privileges and elections. And boy, I tell you, I learned so much on those committees. Um, Many of the topics that we address on our show are issues that constituents have brought to my attention. Um, And before I get going too far in the show, I really do want to give a special thanks to WNTW 820 AM The Answer for the opportunity to provide this free public service to you each week. Um, If you have a question about today's topic, it is a call-in show, town hall. Um, The number here is 804-454-1366, so I'll make sure I don't get carried away and forget that number. I have a very special guest coming on today, um, Dr. John O'Bannon, Delegate Dr. John O'Bannon. He is a lifelong Virginian who has dedicated himself to caring for others. He is... As a child growing up on a farm in Rappahannock County, John helped his family by selling apples at the family fruit stand near Skyline Drive. Now, I remember being in the fourth grade and driving up there, and uh, maybe I got one of your apples, John. (laughs) You just never know. Um, But John O'Bannon's leadership abilities became apparent during his schooling. He was a graduate of Hargrave Military Academy and the University of Richmond Uh, Delegate O'Bannon attended medical school at MCV, where he was elected president of the student body. And working with him in the General Assembly, he is quite the leader. Um, Later, as a resident at MCV, he was elected president of the House Staff Council, served as chairman of the Dean's Advisory Committee, and was named chief resident in in neurology. Uh, Delegate O'Bannon is a well-regarded physician He is a partner in Neurological Associates, a leading Richmond medical practice. And um, those of you who have gone to Henrico Doctors, guess what? He's chief of staff of Henrico Doctors Hospital and even serves on the board of trustees. So, Delegate O'Bannon, are you there? Can you hear us? Okay, I can't hear Delegate O'Bannon, but um, I'm going to keep telling you all these wonderful things about him. He served two terms on VCU Health System Authority Board, where he chaired the Quality Committee. His peers named him one of the Outstanding Physicians of the Year in Richmond Magazine's annual poll. He's a national leader in improving the medical profession. He's a leader in the American Medical Association. He served on the AMA delegation from the Medical Society of Virginia and served as a member of the AMA's Council for Ethical and Judicial Affairs from 1997 through 2004. Here in Virginia, John is a past chairman of the Board of Richmond Academy of Medicine, and he's also served as the chairman of MSV's Legislative Committee, where he helped pass the Virginia Patients' Bill of Rights. Now, do you want to tell the folks, Delegate O'Bannon, about the Virginia Patients' Bill of Rights that you passed uh, thank you so much, man, and I really appreciate your uh, generous and gracious introduction. Uh, I might have sold you a, a peck of apples or a <laughs> half bushel of apples, but it would have been a while ago. Uh, so I've been. Thank you for inviting me to be on your show. I've been involved in advocacy and, and then getting into the real pol- political arena. But uh, some years ago, we were concerned about the uh, imbalance of uh, control and power with the HMO industry. And so the Patients' Bill of Rights was just basically something which uh, gave individual patients uh, more rights to stand up to the insurance companies when they had disagreements on uh, what, what testing somebody needed or what medicines they needed. So uh, it's uh, been an interesting experience to fast forward to where we are now. Wow, isn't that the truth? Well, I know our listeners out there who go all the way from Amelia, the greater Richmond area, all the way to Williamsburg, and there are even folks down almost to the North Carolina who are listening today who are cheering right now. We can't hear them, but they are very appreciative, as well as I am, for um, helping to pass the Virginia Patients' Bill of Rights. Now, Delegate O'Bannon is not just a great physician. He is a leader in our community. Now, you're a member of the West Richmond Rotary Club, the Glen Allen Ruritan Club, and you even serve on the Virginia Holocaust Museum Boards. Very um, diversified background. Um, he's a member of the Henrico County Republican Committee, 
And you've also served, have been very active in numerous federal, state, and local campaigns. And uh, we just had a, a very spirited campaign yesterday, didn't we? or Tuesday, it seems like yesterday, <laughs> with the statewide elections. And um, we're not even going to talk about that today because we're going to, uh, we really want to spend a lot of time addressing people's questions about Medicaid and Medicare expansion. And, um, you know, uh, Dele- Delegate Obana is a member of the Secure Commonwealth Panel and the Joint Commission for Health Care for All Virginians. He currently serves on JLARC and the Virginia War Memorial Board, and he served as a budget conferee for the House for the last four years. Um, and, and so we are just incredibly blessed to have you on our show today. And, um, you know, there's so much information out there. Um, and I asked Delegate O'Bannon to come on, especially after the town hall that I had with Congressman Bratt, and ask him if he could answer some of the questions that we had, because this is his world. Um, and so thank you again for coming on the show today. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, yesterday was Flag Day. We did have uh, elections in Virginia Tuesday, so uh, that the process of democracy goes on. And I'd be happy to uh, chat with you about some of the healthcare things. If you have callers, we'd be tickled to talk to them. That sounds great. So I'm going to give you all that number again. It's 804 454 one three six six. Um, we're going to go ahead and cut to the chase. Um, Virginia and the ACA's Medicaid expansion, and of course, we're we're uh, looking at Trump Care now. But currently, just to make sure everybody is on the same page with us here, there is no Medicaid expansion yet. Even though the governor um, was supportive of this, we have successfully not expanded Medicaid, which, in my opinion, is a Trojan horse. But I am so glad that you're here. Explain to the folks a little bit who might be confused about the difference between what is Medicaid and what is Medicare. So that's a good question. So uh, by 1964, the uh, United States decided they would do what's called Medicare. And Medicare, as you know, is health care for those over 65 uh, or 66, depending on when you were born. And, And Medicare is actually working fairly well. I think about the same time, Medicaid was passed. And Medicaid was originally designed to be a safety net. It was a safety net for low-income people and people who had chronic illness. And it's worked that way uh, for all these years. But every state is different. And so we've had some rich, rich states that have been much more generous. And we've had some uh, more frugal states that uh, Medicaid was not, you know, used for every uh, citizen or for every purpose. What the ACA did, what Obamacare did, was it basically changed Medicaid from a safety net to a universal entitlement. And and the way Medicaid funding works, it's almost an open spigot. Uh, The federal government would put up 50 cents for every 50 cents the state put up uh, as far as, as you wanted to spend. The Medicaid expansion uh, was kind of one of those... uh, things that the federal government often does where they give you that little temporary carrot and then pull it back. Mm-hmm. And so it was 100% for three years and down to 90%. Amanda, as you well know, because you're down there, uh, Medicaid is the Pac-Man of our budget without expansion. It's 22%. So what we did in Virginia was we worked real hard to make our Medicaid program efficient, but it's still at its core a government-run insurance program. And so what we see now, uh, Obamacare passed, and then the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said Medicaid expansion, mandatory Medicaid expansion that every state has to do is unconstitutional because it's unaffordable. And and so where we are now is that we have not expanded Medicaid in Virginia, and with our new federal government, they're looking at ways they can begin to uh, rebalance this, not punish the states that didn't expand Medicaid, but get some handle on on how this works as far as as the cost and the quality of the services that we give people. That's exactly so, right. And and you know to your point, insurance doesn't necessarily equate to care. Insurance does not necessarily equate, equate to quality care. And some of the problems with Medicaid in those states that did expand was that there were not enough providers, there were not enough doctors to see the patients, and so they still wound up going to the ERs. So uh, a lot of us think that a better pathway might be to put some sort of safety net in and 
uh, rebalance the Medicaid back to to uh, what it was originally intended to be, which was actually a safety net. You know, we've got Medicaid expansion. What Obamacare did was it said every healthy, low-income person automatically gets government insurance. At the same time, we've got folks with disabilities waiting for waivers who have chronic conditions that we can't afford to fund. And we're going to come back after the four-minute break, and Delegate O'Bannon is going to finish telling us about why we have chosen not to expand Medicaid in Virginia. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase, and I am State Senator Amanda Chase here with Delegate Dr. John O'Bannon, who is one of only four physicians in the General Assembly. He serves on the Appropriations, Health, Welfare, and Institutions, and Privileges, and and Elections Committee. I'll get that out. Um, John also serves as Chairman of the Economic Development and Natural Resources Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee. Welcome back to the show, Delegate O'Bannon. Thanks for... For staying with us, um, we were just talking about um, why we, as a legislative body, have um, protected um, our. We do not want to ex- to expand Medicaid. It is a Trojan horse that will be a burden to the state governments once the federal government um, gradually uh, pulls away funding from that, and we don't want to get stuck with the bill. So I think we had a lot. Um, now with Trump Care in place, we're finding that we're in a better off place than a lot of other states that did actually um, expand. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? You bet, Amanda. You're right on. Uh, it's very interesting. There, there are a number of states that actually chose to expand Medicaid, and I know of several of those states that are now in emergency special sessions of their legislatures because they're over their budgets and they're having to raise taxes to pay for it. So uh, I can tell you that we are better off now with a pathway where uh, we will be able to rebalance uh, the way Medicaid works. Uh, each state's uniquely different. And so what they tried to do with Obamacare was do a national uh, thing. And the current folks up at the uh, Trump administration, uh, what they call CMS, where they make these rules, I think are much more interested in working with the individual states and giving the states the flexibility uh, to do better programs. There's some interesting things about Medicaid that people don't realize. Having some insurance is probably better than none, but Medicaid, the way it's set up in the government process, the only place where uh, patients get uh, uh, routine travel. And so uh, a patient goes up uh, to uh, MCV, uh, that patient's travel gets paid for. It might be more efficient to have a doctor go down closer to where patients live. Uh, Medicaid dollars can't pay for uh, some of the things that low-income folks need if they have chronic illness. So we, we really focused on trying to take care of the folks with the high-risk needs. We put in a program for the folks that have the substance abuse and need to get detoxed. We did, we've done those things without expanding Medicaid and putting the rest of the budget at risk. You know, Medicaid's already crowding out things that are important to a lot of your listeners, like uh, K-12, through you know, our public school systems and uh, public safety. So I feel very comfortable we're on the right side of this, and I think as we go forward, we'll be able to come up with uh, better programs for our uh, citizens. Absolutely. You know, one of the thing that um, my takeaway from the town hall was that the folks, and seventy five percent of them at the town hall admitted admitted that they had voted in favor of Hillary Clinton for president, and they supported um, Medicaid expansion. Um, they believe that health care is a right. And um, how, what, do you, what do you say to folks that say that? Well, I, I, think, I think the access to care is something that everybody should have. Yes. But health care is also a responsibility. You know, right. People have, have responsibilities to take their medicines and take care of themselves. And so I think you're talking the wrong argument if you say that everybody ought to have this or that you know, prescribed kind of health insurance. We want to have a safety net. We want folks that have chronic illness to get good care. Uh, But uh, if you go to a a totally government-run program, which I think where a lot of folks on the left want to go, you automatically created a two-tiered system that isn't, you know, where the government's going to be making the decisions rather than the people. That's a good point. 
And I know that the people out there would much rather make those decisions. So let's talk about who is eligible, the the age, the blind, the disabled, um, parents with dependent children are eligible with household incomes up, is it 49% of, um, uh, right. 49% of FPL, um, pregnant women are eligible with household incomes up to 143% of federal poverty, um, and children are eligible for Medicaid or CHIP with household incomes up to 200% of federal poverty level. So, um, you know, my big concern is this, is that, as you were saying, our Virginia budget, we have to, by law, the state legislature, we have to balance the budget. We, we can't just use a credit card. You know, my kids, I have four of them, and we, we go to Walmart or wherever. You know, they understand um, the importance that you can't just keep putting things on a credit card. Eventually, there is a bill that comes, and so we have to live within our means. Virginia, the Commonwealth, has to live within its means if we don't live within our means, we have to do one of two things. We either have to, which I've pledged I will never raise taxes. Um, you know, we would either have to raise taxes to come up with those funds or cut benefits at some point or, or make a more efficient system um, that, than what we have currently. Um, tell us a little bit about something that is called the coverage gap whenever – Folks are not eligible for Medicaid in Virginia, but they're also not eligible for premium subsidies because their income is too low. So uh, what you're talking about is one of the uh, uh, things, one of the problems that occurred with Obamacare and the ACA. Obamacare had two parts. One part was the uh, uh, exchanges or the folks where the people that have individual coverage and don't have an employer to to take care of their health care, they have to go by their own policies. And there were subsidies, as you said, available to people, but there was a gap in that from, from the levels of the folks who were too uh, were not uh, eligible for Medicaid, but still had a gap before they could get to the exchanges. So you, you, a while ago you were talking about the various groups uh, that Medicaid covers. Uh, a, a lot of our folks in nursing homes are covered by Medicaid. Almost half of the babies born in Virginia are, are, are covered by Medicaid. Mm. So it's a very large program already. And that's one of the reasons why we felt it was so important to try to make the programs more efficient and work better before we looked at any kind of uh, obligation on the part of Virginia to uh, expand those. So, you know, we were talking about cost really is a huge driving factor in this equation. And um, you know, what are things that we can do to lower those, those costs? Uh, so I think if, and, uh, actually there are some states that are beginning to look at this. Uh, what the Senate's working on now up in Washington and the House already passed, House passed a bill, got a lot of criticism, but I have to tell you, uh, there were elements in that bill that I think are way better than Obamacare. I mean, uh, the things that they were trying to do with the uh, insurance uh, coverage uh, would put us more in the direction of the old days when the policies actually worked for the people. I mean, we've got folks now that are pay paying for insurance that includes, uh, you know, delivering babies, and they already had hysterectomies, and they're folks that are beyond birth age. So uh, going back to the uh, different rating and the different bands, you know, coverage, I think was going in the right direction uh, I don't want to be a smart aleck, but <laughs> if, if the uh, if the hospitals didn't like it and the doctors didn't like it and the insurance companies didn't like it, there's probably something good in it for my constituents. Absolutely. We're going to be back in about 15 seconds. Delegate Dr. O'Bannon, thank you for being on our show today. And stay tuned. We'll be right back. Delegate O'Bannon, stay tuned. This is State Senator Amanda Chase on Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase, and I have as my guest uh, the Honorable Delegate and Dr. John O'Bannon, one of four physicians in the General Assembly, and we're discussing Medicaid expansion under Obamacare versus Trump Care. And, you know, I th I'm thinking back to a constituent that reached out to me. They have a son with spastic dysplasia, and um, the mom stays at home. 
um, because her their son needs full time care. He just turned um, eighteen, and um, you know they were talking to me about that he had lost his Medicaid coverage um, after having it for for a period of time. Um, what a lot of these folks, and that I think the anger that a lot of folks out there have is that they have a loved one that they know so desperately needs this health care, and it's very personal to them. I mean, we all, you and I both know of people um, that, that need this type of help, and, you know, the, the dad is working a job. He was, he was laid off um, from a major employer, um, got a job that wasn't making as much money as he was, so they feel really strapped, and, you know, they're, they're desperate for help, and they're saying, you know, what, what can you do for my son? So how do, how do we as legislators help folks that come to us with these type issues? So each person has their own unique problems and challenges. It sounds like this young man is a young man was probably in the famous program, yes, or the chip program. And so what happened was he actually uh, grew up and aged out of that program. So if if he is uh, is financially low income, he would be eligible for Medicaid. If if not, and he has a disability. He may be eligible for one of the waivers through the waiver programs uh, at the DBHDS, you know, the disability through your uh, community services boards and your local governments. So there may be some some pathways for folks uh, to get some help uh, outside of that uh, traditional venue. Okay, so the community services board, um, they they are kind of the local. Um, DMAS um, that kind of, I guess, allocates that money that Virginia allocates by um, by district, correct? Yeah, so your uh, community services boards are part of your social, each county's social service. Chesterfield has one and RICO has one. And those are the folks that uh, can, can help individual citizens get services. And they'll evaluate each case and... and uh, and try to help folks get into the different levels of these waivers. And so uh, there is the opportunity, I think, for folks to uh, get some help in that arena. So that would be some one thing we could recommend folks to do. And that's currently. I mean, that's not under Trump Care, Obamacare. That's just the way it's already built into our current system. That's correct. And I think one of the one of the things we would very much like to do would be to get under the uh, new proposals that the House is looking at, and in particular the Senate is looking at, they're looking at uh, doing something which would give each state a little more flexibility on how we spend our dollars. And so we might be able to get better control of things. And, and the idea here, obviously, would be that we know what the needs of the people in Virginia are, maybe a little better than the folks up in Washington. Absolutely. Now, are you referring to the block grants from the federal government? Yes. yes. Okay, sure. good. Very and good. That's, yeah, that's, uh, they need to be done right. We don't want to punish Virginia, but if you do a block grant, then we have much better control of how we uh, send those dollars. It goes back to that one of those little things we talked about in current Medicaid is that travel. Uh, you know, maybe it's, it's better to uh, uh, look at other ways to deliver that care to get folks uh, a better primary care, because one of the problems with Medicaid, and particularly with the states that tried Medicaid expansion, was they, did, they found they found they didn't have any providers or nearly enough uh, doctors and, and family doctors to take care of the people that got the coverage. And it just goes back to what you said about having insurance doesn't necessarily assure that you're going to have better health. That's exactly right. And we actually had a small business owner on the show who... Um, actually has a medical oxygen supply company, and there's a couple different key oxygen supply companies that are contemplating going out of business because Medicaid is not reimbursing them for the cost of doing business. So, um, you know, that's yet another challenge. Um, now, I know that there are many folks out there that say that we are leaving money on the table, $14.7 billion. They're saying money the state is leaving on the table over the next decade by not expanding Medicaid? How do we answer that to folks? So uh, I hope folks understand the math here. Yeah, that's uh, important. 
the uh, the numbers uh, are, are really hard. We we don't even know for sure whether we've enrolled everybody that's eligible for current Medicaid. Mm. And so I don't know how in the world you can claim. Uh, the other thing is that there was talk. People were trying to insinuate that we were leaving it or it was going to other states. Uh, if we did not, in, in a lot of states, you know, North Carolina hasn't expanded. Florida hasn't expanded. South Carolina hasn't expanded. Maine hold that, hasn't expanded. Hold that thought. We're going to have to go to a break. But when we come back, we're going to finish talking about did Virginia leave money on the table? To State Senator Amanda Chase with Delegate and Dr. John O'Bannon on Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase. And we're talking about Medicaid and Medicare. It can be very confusing to folks. Simply all they want is health care. They want, they want their loved ones taken care of, and, and not everybody has the money to pay for it. So how do you apply? You can enroll at healthcare.gov or Cover Virginia or by phone at 1-800-318-2596. You can also go to your local Department of Social Services office or apply in person at a Department of Social Services office. Um, Whenever we were, right before the break, we were talking about Virginia uh, leaving money on the table. Um, Is that really true? And um, I'm sorry that I we had to go to the break right there. Those breaks kind of interrupt us sometimes here, but um, I wanted to let you finish your statement there. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, yeah, the, the bottom line here is that if, if Virginia's decision does not send money to other states, our decision actually lowers the rate of growth of the national debt because any dollars that we wouldn't sign up for will stay in the Treasury and uh, reduce the national debt. So we, we feel like that's the prudent approach not to obligate us to something that we have no control over and that has already been proven in a number of states to lead to broken budgets and tax increases or alternatively, having to kick people off of a program once you start it. And, and that's also very difficult. And that's what they've done in some states. Uh, Arkansas, which was touted, uh, uh, had to do some of that. And some of the other states have done that. Mm. Well, I'm telling you, it, it is quite the issue. Now, I know during the General Assembly, we listen to testimony after testimony of folks who are disabled or have disabled children, and they come before um, our our committee, and they testify about they need additional waivers. And, and we, of course, um, we vote in favor of those waivers, but that's very different than any type of Medicaid expansion. Those are waivers. I just thought it would be good for you to maybe explain that. What is the difference between the waivers? Well, so some of the folks that get waivers are funded through Medicaid. But we also spend money on the waivers beyond that, and we're redesigning some of those waivers. That's a combination of, of social services uh, and the health department. Uh, but we have uh, we've done, I think, a good job of expanding those waiver slots, and they go to each locality. Uh, but uh, we could be a lot more efficient with, with where we're trying to go is where we can be more efficient and get people the services they need and, and serve more folks. Now, under the former system, you had intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities. Now, that's changing to a new system, correct? I think that's correct. And, and those new uh, names will uh, try to line up the folks. You know, there's some folks who really need 24-hour, seven-day-a-week care. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of folks who would rather live in their own home and just and have some help. And so the new waivers, I, uh, the, the names are different. I don't have the names in front of me. But, but those new waivers are designed to try to get people more precisely the services that they need and that they want, because I think most folks would rather stay in their own home. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, so I'm trying to think of, I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions here that folks have asked us, and maybe I'll ask those real quick. I know we don't have a whole lot of time left here on the show today, and um, it's been great having you on here. Um, this person, Judith, says Obamacare Affordable Care Act fallacy Um, is a fallacy. Until our family actually had to use the marketplace for health insurance, I thought it was a great option to allow individuals to have access to health care. Now I realize it needs a major overhaul. Because I'm on Medicare and can no longer carry my grandson on my policy, we use the marketplace to find health insurance. Since he's 19 years old and will be attending college and has no job, 
His only option was Virginia Medicaid. Virginia Medicaid does not offer coverage, only an option called Plan First, which only covers family planning. No hospital, doctor, or prescription coverage. The affordable, this, this person is saying this, the Affordable Care Act is a lie. I guess he will be expected to pay a penalty for not having health insurance or health coverage. And, you know, that's one good thing about Trump Care is that there's no penalty. So you're talking now about the uh, exchanges and what the Obamacare did. The day Obamacare passed, all these folks that we know that, and I, I'm a doc, I treat a lot of people, they had worked real hard to get an insurance policy that worked for them. Maybe they had needed medications, maybe they needed tests. The day that bill passed, your government said that insurance is not good enough. And you're going to have to go get a government-approved plan and it's going to have these specific things in it. And that sounds great. The problem is it's not working. So the exchanges are now in a death spiral. And and the good and it, it ran all of, the, all of the, you're right, it's a, it's a stick. It's not a carrot. And that stick is that you have to pay a penalty to the government if you don't have health insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump care is going to incentivize people. The way it's set up, you will, you'll want to keep the plan because hopefully the plan will be, more tailored to your needs. And and you got to have certain things in an insurance policy. Insurance only works if you can't buy fire insurance after the uh, house is on fire. You have to have coverage. That means you've got to have an annual enrollment period. And while you, you, you can, if you have a pre existing commission, uh, condition, you ought to get a plan and stay on it. And so the way the Trump Care is designed, I think, is going to be much more of an incentive based to try to encourage people to get a plan that works for them because it won't be as expensive and then keep it. That's great. Well, listen, um, we really appreciate you coming on the show today as one of the four physicians serving in the General Assembly of all 140 of us. Um, it's an honor to have you on the show, and we appreciate um, you coming on today and kind of explaining the intricacies of Medicaid, Medicare, um, I know there's a lot of confusion out there with our listeners, and um, we appreciate having the expert in the house. So thanks for being on the show today. So uh, let me thank you for your service. And uh, i got to tell you, all your listeners, she's got an open door. She's a quick study. Uh, she works real hard, and we're actually real lucky to have her in the state Senate. So thank you, Amanda. Oh, you're great. Well, thanks for coming on today. Again, Dr. and Delegate, the Honorable John O'Bannon. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. You know, I am committed between now and session. Um, I want to bring on uh, key legislative experts. Um, a lot of my um, colleagues um, serve in various fields and are experts. And I want to bring the very best to you. I want you to understand the issues and sometimes the media um, and the hype. Um, <laughs> we don't always know what to believe, do we? So, um, you know, I am committed to um, having a, a great guest speaker on and um, just appreciate you all listening today because we really do uh, want to bring issues that are important to you and and, and cut to the chase, right? So um, anyway, we are working on uh, reaching out to other fellow legislators and having one on the show each week to um, allow you the opportunity to get to know them, get to know what issues are important to you that they um, drive the legislation for. So stay tuned. We'll be right back for the final segment of Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thanks again for joining us today on Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase on WNTW 820 The Answer. Um, I hope you join us again next Thursday for our weekly town hall from 4 to 5 as, um, as we invite you to, to call into our show. We really do want to hear from you, and um, I appreciate those of you that reached out to our office. And this is probably one of the biggest questions that we hear in town halls, and um, people ask me um, when I'm out on the football field um, about... Medicaid, Medicare. So I really appreciate Delegate O'Bannon uh, for coming on the show today and, um, you know, just having, you know, being in the medical field and completely understanding um, this issue and able to bring that to you today. So if you have questions 
Uh, get your in, We want to get your input. We want to address your issues that are important to you. If you're not comfortable calling in, which I, I tell you, write down the number, save it for next week, 804-454-1366. I really do want to hear from you. Um, you can also reach out to on my website. I have all my contact information there, chaseforsenate.com. Um, I really do try hard to, um, if you sign up on there, send you notices of upcoming events, town halls, which I do weekly, um, or, a, or a weekly newsletter that, that I actually um, put out every week during session and once a month out of session. We have so much going on even out of session. Um, or, of course, you can always tune in here every Thursday on WNTW AM, The Answer. We're going to have a lot of great um, speakers coming up from the Virginia, Virginia General Assembly and, and other special guests. And we're working on our programming um, from now to the end of the year. And um, we're going to have a lot of good topics. So you won't want to miss it. So we've learned a lot today. And I just want to reiterate again, if you want to enroll online um, for, if you think that you might qualify for Medicaid, you can go to healthcare.gov or Cover Virginia by phone at 1-800-318-2596 um, or one 252 You can mail a paper application to your local Department of Social Services office or apply in person at a Department of Social Services office. So um, I hope we have answered some of your questions today. Um, if you feel like there are some questions that um, you'd like us to answer on, on um, next Thursday's show, you know, feel free to send those in and uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, we have one minute left of the break. I'm just going to make a quick comment. I want to congratulate our winners of Tuesday's primary. We had the Republican and Democratic primaries. And um, I know that for Governor uh, Ed, Ed Gillespie won. Um, he will be running against Ralph Northam. And uh, Ralph is currently the uh, lieutenant governor. He presides over the Senate. So I've had the opportunity to uh, really get to know him. And um, so uh, and then for uh, lieutenant governor, Jill Vogel won. And so we're excited to uh, frankly see a woman on the ticket. Um, I think it's great that we have a little diversity on the ticket. Um, Senator Bryce Reeves is a great guy too. But um, and then John Adams for Attorney General. So um, we've got a great ticket ahead. I hope you guys get behind them. And uh, until next week, stay tuned. Cut to the chase with Senator Chase.